Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. In this video, I will be talking about Mansfield Park by Jane Austen. We're getting through all the Austen novels. So of course, again, this is a reread for me. Um, Mansfield Park is one that I haven't read as many times as some of the other Austen novels. I didn't um, really consider it one of my favorites. Um, I think the younger version of myself reading this book never really gave it um, the credit it deserves. I think I, I just sort of found Fanny as a heroine to be a bit uninspiring and she's kind of like not very fun and she's really like completely um, passive in the story. She doesn't have a lot of agency in what happens in her life. And all of that is still true, but I feel like on this reading, I understood Fanny and her position in the world a little bit more. Uh, I feel like Edmund was a much bigger problem for me in this reading of the book. And I think I just, I um, gained a bigger appreciation for all the other characters in this story. Um, Mansfield Park feels kind of unique. There's a lot more going on in the plot than just what is affecting Fanny. You know, there's lots of other young people in this story that are very complicated and interesting characters. And while I think the story could have gone a slightly different direction, I can see um, some of the subtle change and development in Fanny. She is kind of like... Um, Eleanor in Sense and Sensibility, where she starts out already good and doesn't have that much changing to do. Um, but I think there are some changes as far as her just being a little more bold and self-assured. Very, very slightly more so. So our story starts when Fanny is a child, which is interesting. I feel like we don't often see um, much time spent on the childhoods of Austen characters. But it's important for setting up the um, social context for Fanny. So Fanny is a cousin of the wealthy established Bertram family. Um, her mother married beneath her and is kind of like a sad story. And so the Bertram family wanting to be useful to her take um, her eldest daughter to live with them. Of course most of them have their own like pretty selfish motivations in that, um, but that kind of sets up the beginning of the story and um, Fanny's inferior position to her cousins. So Fanny is like humble to a fault. Um, she's very meek and quiet. Um, a lot of the internal things that we see from her and her behavior around everyone really boils down to like a complete lack of self-worth or like believing that she deserves anything at all. Like she is intensely aware of <laughs> the fact that she is of a different social status than her cousins. And you know, so we have a character like Mrs. Norris who feels like she needs to constantly remind Fanny of that, but Fanny doesn't need any reminders. She's like really internalized that already. And she's really trying to not be seen <laughs> by anyone throughout the whole story. And that's kind of where um, the main changes and conflict for Fanny personally come in is when she starts getting attention that she never wanted. So her mind is well informed. Uh, she has like a good foundation of principles and like good feminine humility. She is in a lot of ways kind of the ideal woman of the time period. And she also has this um, little romantic streak to her. Um, you know, we often see her like waxing poetic about um, you know, the natural wonders around her and things like that. So in this Austen novel, we're getting kind of a, a Cinderella thing. Fanny is most definitely a downtrodden underdog, um, you know, being looked down upon by her wicked stepsisters, I guess, and her cousins and 
I suppose Mrs. Norris is kind of the stepmom character. But you know, you definitely feel as a reader repeatedly how unjust that she is treated, how little her cares and wants are thought about. She's often just like forgotten and neglected even by the most well-meaning members of the Bertram family. So you definitely like feel bad for her. Um, sometimes you wish she'd speak up more. Like later at the end of the book when she's leaving the family home, her younger sister Susan kind of takes her place in the Bertram household and it seems to be implied that Susan isn't going to have the same intense uh, quietness problems that Fanny has, which is for the best. But yeah, I mean, all of the things that happen to Fanny, she's very rarely making decisions for herself. Um, everybody's kind of deciding where she's going to go and what she's going to do. And it's not very often that people sort of think, well, what does Fanny want in that equation? So on one hand, that can be kind of annoying to have a narrator who doesn't make like any decisions in the book. But on the other hand, uh, it makes sense for her position in this time period. She was completely dependent on her uncle, Sir Thomas, and his family. So yeah, she's just gonna do whatever they say and go wherever they tell her to go. And then I think it makes like the one decision she makes on her own uh, stand out even more, which is saying no to Henry Crawford, which we will talk more about. And from the very beginning of the book, um, Fanny is sort of secretly pining over Edmund, uh, one of her cousins, and has this sort of long unrequited love for him, which is weird because he kind of raised her <laughs> in some ways. Um, we'll definitely talk about this more, but I mean, it's not uncommon in Austen novels to have romantic pairings that are indicative of the time, but maybe seem a little weird to us with modern eyes. You know, the Emma romance is something kind of similar. But that one does not feel as weird as this one. This one feels like the weirdest. Yeah, in my opinion, uh, I, don't, I don't love the match, but we'll talk about that more. So let's spend a little time on Edmund. Uh, he really bugged me on this reading. <laughs> He's all the like highly principled, no fun, wet blanket kind of stuff that Fanny is, but he's also like a worse judge of character and is very inconstant in that he says all of those things but doesn't always follow through on them. And he's just like so dumb. So Edmund spends a lot of this book sort of agonizing over being in love with Mary Crawford. Um, and he's very deceived in his character as Fanny can like perceive from the jump because Fanny is right about everything in this book. And it's not really like Mary Crawford is like actively trying to deceive him. She says like everything that he needs to know to understand her character to his face. He just doesn't believe her. <laughs> he doesn't take anything she says at face value. He just imagines, oh, there's all these reasons and excuses and oh, she's just like playful. She doesn't really mean it. And he kind of just like invents all these layers and depth to Mary Crawford that aren't really there. And he attributes like all of her faults to her environment and the people around her. Like she's like, this poor innocent thing that's just been influenced by everyone, which doesn't give her much credit. Yeah, and I mean, sort of at the very end of this book, he admits this, but he made up a fake woman to fall in love with, and every single bit of evidence he got to the contrary, he just ignored. And there's so much about his dynamic with Fanny that is weird to me. Um, he's much older than her, he's like, a teen when she arrives and she's a little girl and he like forms her mind and her opinions and he's like the arbiter of all the things she should know and all the things she should think and it's weird when you're like reading that with the context of them ending up together it's like he's like building his perfect little wife <laughs> 
I really didn't expect to become such um, an Edmund hater with this reading, but uh, he might be my least favorite Austin uh, guy. I don't know, he's just like, he's always saying such dumb things and he's, he's like speaking in a way that's very hurtful to Fanny and has no idea he's doing it. Like uh, the scene where they're like walking in the garden at Southerton and he's with Mary and Fanny and then Fanny, because her health is bad, needs to take a break. And they're like, oh, we're, we're just going to walk over here. We'll be right back. And they're gone for like an hour and a half. Like, Edmund's kind of mean to Fanny in that neglectful way for a lot of this book. So let's talk about uh, some of the adults in this book um, who try and fail to guide the young people. I don't know. They're not all trying. and They don't all have good intentions. But. So we have Sir Thomas Bertram. In the context of his family, he means well. He has good principles. His methods are not great. Like, he, he wants to be affectionate, but he approaches everyone very coldly because he thinks that's going to make them better people, and it pretty much backfires across the board. And he's just like ignorant of what's really going on in his family. He doesn't really know his children and he can't correct their mistakes when he doesn't even know like what their weaknesses are. And also it's on sort of the outskirts of this novel. Um, it's mainly just a plot device to get him out of the way so the kids can get into some trouble. Um, but it is implied that he owns slaves, so he's like dealing with that for part of the book and is absent for a while. Um, that's a topic that Austin does not often touch, so. Then we have his wife, Lady Bertram, who I think is like comedically one of my favorite side characters in this book. She's very funny. She like is like lazy and just sort of lounges about and is like so even like nothing excites her she's just kind of like there she's like very ornamental in a lot of ways and then she's just like not self-aware at all she's like deeply uh selfish and doesn't see it like um when fanny's having that ball at home and Lady Bertram sends her like lady's maid up to her to help her get her hair done so that she'll look extra nice, but Fanny, not expecting that treatment at all, had already done all of the getting ready. And so even though the lady's maid didn't help anything, like Lady Bertram's just like shocked in herself that she would uh, do something so kind for Fanny and she's just like talking about it the rest of the night. And that's kind of like the first time that people really talk about um, Fanny growing into like a pretty woman and Lady Bertram is just like oh yeah I did that <laughs> and then we have Mrs. Norris who is like pure evil <laughs> she is definitely the wicked aunt of this book um, I feel like Austin doesn't often go so extreme um, but Mrs. Norris is like truly irredeemably vile the entire book. She is so mean and cruel to Fanny. She spends all of her time trying to like put Fanny in her place and like raise the Bertram girls, uh, Maria in particular, as like, oh look at these perfect girls. They're so great and Fanny you're awful. <laughs> and literally everything that happens Mrs. Norris attributes to being Fanny's fault. Which is funny because Fanny is like literally sitting quietly in a corner for the entire book. But yeah, she, she's obsessed with maintaining this distinction um, between them, which in the raising of these girls is ultimately harmful for all of them because Fanny has no confidence and self-worth a lot because of Mrs. Norris. And Maria and Julia have an inflated sense of self and sense of vanity. But you know, this is a great example of Austin um, giving people some of their just desserts. Um, sometimes the villains kind of get away with it and just go on with their lives, but Mrs. Norris really gets her punishment when she has to join Maria in her like permanent exile. Which is also like, you gotta get Mrs. Norris out of the way because there's <laughs> no happy ending where Mrs. Norris is still nearby. Like, you'd have to either 
kill her or send her away. So we talked about Edmund. Let's talk about the other Bertram children a little bit. We have Tom, the eldest, the heir to all of Sir Thomas's estate and title. And he is like outwardly causing trouble, you know, drinking with his friends, gambling, doing lots of things he should not be doing. And Sir Thomas is very aware of this to a fault because he's kind of hyper focused on Tom's faults and like worrying about this son that he's raised to the point where he doesn't notice like the problems with his daughters. But yeah, Tom is just like deeply unserious and irresponsible and he doesn't have um, that foundation of principles that Edmund operates under. So then Maria and Julia, as I said uh, to their father, they have the appearance of being everything right. And to a lot of people, they have the appearance of being everything right. They're elegant, fine, accomplished young ladies, but they're missing like a moral code. And they've been encouraged to be vain. But early in the book, you kind of see moments throughout where Austin kind of drops some hints that Julia's mind is more ready to be molded than Maria's or that, you know, there's some chance for her to change because even if she's doing all the wrong things, she has some consciousness of doing all the wrong things. <laughs> like there's a few moments where they're treating Fanny unfairly and then we kind of get a glimpse inside Julia's head where it's like, she knows she shouldn't be doing that which does come to fruition in the conclusion of the book. So the uh, strangers coming to town who kind of mix up this family circle and start the plot moving are the Crawfords, uh, brother and sister, Henry Crawford and Mary Crawford. And it's these two characters that I think um, make this book so brilliant. Like this is what is great about Mansfield Park because they're, they're so complex, you know, they could easily just be straight villains who are like trying to deceive everyone and just being bad the entire book, but they're not, uh, you know, without the possibility of change. I think especially, you know, reading this book for the first time and not knowing where the characters end up, Austin really lets you see and believe how each of them could become better versions of themselves, whether they get to that ending or not. There's a world in which um, sort of the faults of their upbringing could be corrected. And they kind of are exactly um, what sort of the Bertrams need to uh, identify uh, their fatal flaws, I guess, you know. They're kind of their downfall and also um, a way for them to see themselves more clearly if they get past the downfall part. Because you know we have two very vain sisters in um, Maria and Julia and Henry when we first meet him is also very vain and wants everyone to love him and the sisters are competitive against each other and trying to win Henry's love. And then Mary really challenges um, Edmund's choices for his life to be in the clergy. Um, she really challenges his principles. Like, is Edmund going to stand by what he knows is right? This is maybe the first real test for him in his life, falling in love with Mary Crawford. But yeah, they both have this possibility of change and that possibility really comes in the characters that they love. Um, Henry and Mary both have enough sense to kind of fall for good people, and there's the possibility that that could make them better people too. Mary falls in love with Edmund, and there's no doubt that she really loves him, you know, and despite her kind of um, want for status and money, she's like, oh, but here's someone who's really good, who's not going to have all of that, and I still love him anyways. So that indicates there's something good in Mary. Now, it maybe seems a little this likely between the pair that Mary 
would change. Like Fanny, who I said is like pretty much always right in this book, she thinks that if Edmund and Mary um, were to get married with each other, it would not work out. <laughs> that just eventually Edmund would be uh, disillusioned and understand her real character, and that maybe she is less changeable in some way. But you know, that's clouded a little bit by Fanny's own feelings for Edmund, so I mean, maybe if that path had continued, she could have changed, but at least there, there's this glimmer of something good in her. You know, she's not just playing with Edmund, she has very real feelings for him, and Austin makes sure we know that. Henry is different because we actually do see him changing. Um, he's getting better and we're kind of rooting for him for a portion of this book. So he has this like vanity and cruelty and playing with Maria and Julia without seriously being interested in either of them. Um, you know, even before the actual big thing, uh, he gets pretty close to ruining Maria's life because she's engaged when they first meet. And I mean, he breaks both of their hearts and he like does it on purpose. But then sort of having the same intentions with Fanny, he kind of accidentally falls in love with her. Which, you know, like, that's a good story. Um, him trying to do something cruel and then accidentally falling in love and then being changed and influenced by her in ways that he couldn't expect. Because he wants to be better, he sees how good Fanny is, and because he loves her, he wants to be good too. Like, that that's a good story. He's being changed by love and he wants to be changed. Uh, we see a lot of time spent on that and Fanny herself, despite never really wanting to marry Henry, um, she acknowledges that he's improving. But then, you know, he could have had it all really, um, but he kind of stumbles with his own weakness. Uh, he puts himself back in the path of Maria, and then he falls all the way down and does like the worst thing he could do that ruins his chances of ever being with Fanny. So let's talk about that. Um, it's interesting for a lot of Mansfield Park, it's just a lot of people talking and like, do I like this person? Like, is, am I going to marry this person? Blah, blah, blah. Like, it's just a lot of like back and forth and Fanny observing. You know, we kind of have like the high point with the whole play sequence, which is really revealing of a lot of the um, essential flaws of all of the characters. And then those flaws get like fully exposed with this big high dramatic point of Maria and Henry running away together. And that is like a really big bad thing for a character to do in an Austen novel. I feel like we don't often see characters do something like this bad. This is very, very scandalous. Um, I feel like the only thing comparable is like Willoughby's transgressions and Sense and Sensibility. Like this decision, Maria is ruined forever. She gets a divorce. Like, can you imagine a divorce in an Austen novel? And then she literally has to go into exile for the rest of her life. Like, it's that bad. But then I was sort of thinking about, you know, why is this so much bigger than, like, the bad things, the transgressions that happen in other Austen novels? And it's like, this novel needed something really, really big and really bad to make Henry and Fanny an impossibility. Because, like I said, <laughs> you're kind of rooting for Henry. He's starting to change. He's genuinely, passionately in love with Fanny. And like everything is being set up and it's so close to Edmund and Mary being together and Henry and Fanny being together that the only way for Edmund and Fanny to end up together is to have a huge rift. So let's talk about Henry versus Edmund. I don't know if me being like an Edmund hater and like kind of rooting for Henry is like 
a hot take or if that's like what lots of people come out of this book thinking, but that's kind of where I'm at. <laughs> There's really, within the scenes in this book, we don't see much like romance at all between Edmund and Fanny. They act like siblings really the entire book and you know when Edmund realizes Fanny someone he could marry it's kind of just summarized for us. We don't really see um, any of that. So there's no like building romance between them. Like we just know that Fanny loves Edmund but we don't really see Edmund treat her in that way at all. And all of those kind of romantic beats in the story, they're all going to Henry. So, you know, the, the book makes you like see Henry as this romantic uh, character. He's changing, he's growing, he's falling in love where he didn't intend to. He's doing the romantic gestures. You know, the, the ball scene with Henry is like very sweet. Um, he exerts himself to get Fanny's brother William promoted to a lieutenant, which is like the kindest thing anyone could do for Fanny. Like she has no choice but to be grateful for that. He shows up to Portsmouth when Fanny is with her parents for a few months. You know, he shows up out of the blue. It's like very, it's romantic. And we see him take, you know, the duty of being this estate holder more seriously because he knows that's what Fanny would want. So he has this great love uh, and it really legitimately changes him. And there's definitely a part of me that thinks that Fanny would have been positively changed too by being with a partner who is a bit bolder, a bit more social. And like they both have that kind of like romantic tendency and like with Henry's principles improving, there's a lot of other things that would make him and Fanny very compatible. So I feel like more so than any other Austen novel, she's really acknowledging some gray here in these two paths that Fanny's life could have taken. I mean, Austin pretty much explicitly says that Fanny could have been happy and had a good life with either of them. Like, this isn't a story about soulmates, which is really interesting to me. You know, there's a version of this story where Henry never puts himself in the path of Maria and that big awful thing they did never happens. And in that version of the story, Edmund was probably going to end up with Mary. Uh, his probable happiness is a little more uncertain, but then Fanny, being a reasonable person, would give up her love for Edmund and accept Henry eventually. And with her making him sort of the best version of himself, they would have been happy together. But his own actions, you know, are his downfall. Um, he really loves Fanny and he'll never get that life with her because of what he did. So he has some like very real regrets to live with there, as does Mary who legitimately loved Edmund and was separated from him forever. So I don't know, that that gray area leaves me feeling justified in um, preferring Henry, um, obviously with the events of kind of the final act of this book. He's no longer an option, but everything leading up to that, like Henry's my guy. Yeah, this is an interesting one. I mean, I can understand kind of my feelings about it. Um, as a younger reader, it's been a, a few years since I've read Mansfield Park, um, but now, I mean, it's such an interesting perspective to take with this kind of wallflower character who's just like desperate to not be pulled into the story. And I definitely like Fanny more after this reading. Yeah, I don't know, it, it feels like um, Austin maturing as a writer um, to allow for, for so much gray area to see like there's not one path to happiness in your life, but you know, your circumstances are going to take you 
one way. Yeah, I definitely, I have a higher appreciation for this one now. Um, it was more fun than I remembered, kind of Fanny witnessing all of the drama between this whole cast of young people, you know, falling in love with the wrong person and getting their feelings hurt and all of that. Yeah, and this is the one where um, we get that kind of meta moment from Austin at the end where she says, let other pens dwell on guilt and misery, which I feel like is very indicative of Austin's philosophy as a ironist novelist in general. You know, all the Austin novels, they, they have happy endings. That doesn't make them less serious or less important works by any means. It, it feels like kind of a statement to end on those notes. You know, we'll, we'll talk a lot about her feelings about sort of the, the high drama gothic novels when we read Northanger Abbey, um, but she's intentionally not sitting in the drama and dwelling in it, very much so in this book, because so much of the most dramatic moments, Fanny's not even there to witness directly, she's just getting it through letters. Like that's very much a, a conscious choice to not indulge in that. Yeah, I don't know, that that moment has always felt like very, oh, this is this is Austin all the time. Okay. Yeah, I think with Mansfield Park, um, I don't think I would recommend it as like a first Austin to read, but definitely an important one to get to if you've already read a couple of the others. Okay, well, that's all I have for this video. Thanks for watching. Bye.